Hello, uh, I'm Yanis. I, uh, I want to talk about internationalization. I'm not sure how you pronounce it correctly, but I'm a German, so I don't have to know this. <laughs> it is a long word, though, so this is good. Um, <laughs> So um, who am I? Why am I talking about internationalization? Um, I used to manage the Django, Django translations. I took it over a little bit from Malcolm. He used to do that. It's not very glamorous work. It means that SVN committing stuff and you know with stuff that you don't really understand. Nowadays, I'm not doing that anymore. I you know, handed it off to Claude, the poor fellow. Um, <laughs> the thing, the, I'm also a web developer at Mozilla, uh, working on the MDN, which is the Mozilla Developer Network. Um, the reason why I'm actually still kind of into this kind of topic is that because we are, uh, you know, Mozilla is into this global market of uh, technology, as you may know. And for example, the MDN is translated or has translated content in its wiki uh, in 36, uh, 36 languages and locales, uh, which may makes it one of the, you know, uh, really a problematic thing to do to work with all those uh, editors. So, um, yeah, I have a, you know, I've seen it all. <laughs> It's, uh, it's really an annoying sometimes. But anyways, um, just a quick show of hands. Who has developed a multilingual site before? Oh, okay. Damn it. <laughs> All right, fair enough, fair enough. Who speaks English as a first language? Okay, there we go. Um, okay, let's go on. Uh, <laughs> why are we talking about internationalization anyways? What's, it, what's this all about? And um, yeah, what is this picture on the on the screen? Um, you may have seen it before. It's the Stone of Rosetta, which is an ancient piece of uh, stone uh, written with in three different languages, basically praising a king, uh, like an ancient king in Egypt, um, like 200 before Christie. It's like really old thing. The cool thing about it, and that's why I'm kind of trying to kind of build a bridge here, is that um, is that it contained, uh, it contained one language, the, the old Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs, that were uh, not known before. And uh, the, all, the other two languages, uh, Demotic and Old Greek, were actually known to scientific, uh, scientists when they found it. So they were from the languages that they knew, uh, able to deduct the, the hieroglyphs, um, which is kind of a big deal because this, you know, this shows, um, you know, this is a pretty boring thing, it's a, like a stone, but still it had a great value to actually transmit the cultural values and the con content of this thing, you know, praising this king, whatever, uh, uh, st still 2,000 years ago, uh, later, I mean. So, but how does it relate to us, of course? We are here, we are you know, web developers living in the 21st century, what, whatever. It's something that um, shouldn't have a connection, but still, um, this stone was a tool to trans, you know, transport identity and uh, transport information, transport cultural uh, information between you know, completely separate um, you know, worlds at that time. Greek, you know, the, the demotic, uh, demotic um, which are just bureaucrats basically, and the old uh, Egyptian um, uh, kings and uh, yeah, like half beings. And to me this is important because Django, in that sense, is you know one of those tools that allow us in this modern world where we have a global society uh, actually to do the same. So, in other words, Django is a tool to reach exactly you know to do exactly the same thing as with this stone to reach more of our audience, which is the global audience. Um, so, um, this is all kind of hand waving, I know, but the thing is, this is actually really matters. The current web, as we know it. It's more than 50% uh, in English, which is a well, it's a well a bad proportion because only 5% of the world po world's population speak it. So and even less, 20% have a basic understanding of it. The rest of those people uh, in the world um, actually have no idea what English is. So it's really really a bad situation where you are right, right now. And as you as you know, Django is primarily a Django web framework, even though it does a couple of other things. We strive to create that tool that allows us to, to build better for the web. That's what, what we are striving to do. So let's uh, look, uh, take a look at another uh, language with, with has, which has a similar size in first, well, with native speakers basically, which is Arabic in this case. It's like a, 
a sizable fraction of, uh, of that what English actually is currently on the web. And despite the fact it's still like 4% of world's population is actually native speaker in that language. Same thing for Hindi, even less. 0.1% of the web is in, er in Hindi. That's a big deal because it's even more. It's high 5% are native speakers in that language. I know this all this this you know just examples and there are so many other languages and so many other like things that um, don't particularly actually touch us here in the Western uh, Western world, but this is this really matters for us. I mean, coming from Mozilla, I kind of got indoctrinated with that as well a little bit. So that we, if we want to basically keep on doing great uh, web tools or tools to build the web, we gotta gotta be better in this. And why is that? The, according to a uh, recently published white paper by, the, by Mozilla and the GSMA, which is the uh, consortium out of 800 different mobile providers all over the world, which is uh, providing also the GSM standard for connectivity, um, they're gonna, there's going to be uh, 4 billion new connected people in the next 10 years. 4 billion new connected people in the next 10 years. 90% out of those are actually in, the, in, in countries that don't speak Western languages. So 3.6% billion people are going to be new on the internet. And then most primarily uh, on the mo mobile internet. So we gotta be better in what we do. You know, we gotta improve Django so that we can actually help all those people that we can actually continue building software based on Django to deliver you know, uh, sensible and, you know, multilingual and multicultural uh, web to them. This is important to me personally, you know, I'm a German as I mentioned. Uh, you know, we have this weird language sometimes, but there are lots of other like uh, cultural differences that are drastically different to what we've so far actually handled with. So my summary of this is the future is a global web. We gotta, gotta be, um, you, know, you know, we gotta improve on this and Supporting internationalization is not optional. It's basically the, the, it must be the core feature of anything that we do uh, in the future. And that's really important. So, long words, as I mentioned. And there's lots of abbreviations here as well. How do we get, uh, how do we help those four billions to, you know, use their own cultural, their own uh, local uh, differences to one, uh, one another to actually, you know, experience the web how we are used to it? First of all, as I mentioned, internationalization. There are three steps to actually get to there. Sorry, I've got to jump back a bit. Three steps to get there. It's internationalization, translation, and localization. Those are all terms that if you've, you've heard before, I'm pretty sure about it. Um, but I want to go into a little bit what actually those mean and just to clarify things that, you know, this, there's so, so much you know, confusion about what actually those things do. So internationalization, as I mentioned, is a process of making sure that the software that you develop is prepared to be localized, I mean, prepared to be um, adapted to a specific target audience, to target uh, culture. Um, it basically, it only enables the software to be um, uh, adapted. So without engineering effort, that's a, that's a key uh, here. Uh, in other words, Internationalization is only the pre preparation phase into making sure that you're you know, capable of helping those, uh, those that um, you know, not live in the Western, Western world. Um, here's a good example of how this works for Django. You know, you've all kind of done that before, so I'm, I'm happy to be honest because I don't have to go into all the details how Django specifically works, uh, despite the fact that all the other talks have done that. Uh, here's a good example. How do I mark a string and a template so that um, it can be translated in a way that the plural forms of this small sentence, this small uh, snippet of text actually work? So depending on the messages count here passed into the, into the template context, it uses different kinds of text. Later on, when you actually um, get to translating it, it will, depending on the language you choose, use the right plural form. Anyways, in other words, Internationalization is about marking strings for translation while it, it is developed, not, not as a second thought later on. Same thing works for writing backend code, like this uh, silly Django view. Um, it passes in a uh, Python string uh, called about us, 
but it also has to be uh, to make sure that the string that is passed in is actually capable of being translated on the current requests language. So, in other words, uh, into the language of uh, of the user that currently requests uh, this particular Django view. Um, as you can see, it uses a um, simple function in a, in a utility uh, module uh, to do that. It's called get text. We're gonna get to there later though. Next thing, translation, the next phase where you actually get, use those marked terms that you've done in, a, in your template and your, in your backend code and turn it in a way that, that, actually, that help your, um, your translators to dive in and directly translate it. There are other two, uh, two options to do that. Um, one is actually content stored in a database. So you may want to have something that is not part of your code code but actually stored in uh, persistent storage and and I'm going to punt on this because it's a whole different kind of uh, problem documentation how do I make sure that your software is documented in a way that all different cultures understand it and and yeah um, so let's take a look at how you would actually hand over a translation to a to a translator there's this uh, format called uh, PO files, which is part of get text, as I mentioned. It's a, again, it's a very simple plain text file that you can hand over to your translators and he will fill in the blanks. In this case, this, um, this message string zero and message string one. In this case, you see this is uh, a German translation and that's because German only has one plural form, which is this message string one here. But imagine, for example, a language where there are more than just one plural form, uh, Russian or Arabic, I, you know, I think there are a couple of them, uh, depending on the number that is involved with a, with a string, um, have a longer, uh, longer list here. But that's not, that's not my point. I just wanted to make sure that you understand what the format is, what uh, your translators will see, which is, it's not very nice, you know, it's super technical, it's not very uh, user friendly. Um, as I mentioned, storing data in a uh, st storing content in a database where you want to reference a language, so it make it a language specific depending on your users, is also often a very simplistic. You know, as you can see here, it's a demo model that has that just uses another a character field to f to store the this revisions this kind of example wiki revisions um, uh, content depending on a language. So this is very simplistic, but I just want to mention it, that there are two sides of this uh, translation uh, system. So let's, the third thing, localization. That's, as I mentioned, the second part of actually after the preparation uh, part and the translation part, uh, the third, sorry, is actually actually adapting your software to a specific cultural um, uh, environment. So that imagine um, number for, the, for number and date formatting, punctuation, currency formatting, all kinds of things that are you know different uh, between countries as well as uh, you no know, areas in countries. You know, take for example India that has lots of different uh, languages. So in, in Django, this looks pretty boring. It's a Python module that contains, depending on the um, uh, the, the language that you would choose different kinds of uh, module level <coughs> variables that contain information such as like the first day of the week depends you know it's you know it varies you know it's super weird sometimes that you ha that we even have have to think about this but it's it matters people are used to it it's a uh, like um, centuries old uh, information that we can't ignore Django uh, misses lots of information though and that's kind of a also kind of a the problem here is that um, we are not good at that yet um, the actual feature localization is completely automatic. You enable this weird uh, setting here, and then it's automatically done. You can disable it depending on what you, your use case is, but it's, um, it's you're either you're in or you're out, and that's I think also a problem because it means that you assume that there are cases where someone is not living in a cultural environment, which is not true. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> like, like the Australia or. New Zealand, Britain. Did, I, did, did you know that I actually changed the slides to have a S instead of a Z in the internationalization word? I wasn't sure what to use. I did fix a US date bug in my code last week, so. See, so. Doesn't solve your problems. 
problems. Exactly. So the Commonwealth has its own problems. I know. The thing, <laughs> but so let's get back to it. The thing is, all those three things are pretty hard. So let's take a step back and relax for a minute. I know this sucks, but now I'm going to deep dive a little bit more. It's um, because, frankly, I'm not very proud of this. Um, this is the module that contains most of the, the code. It's been there. Jacob mentioned it yesterday to me. 2007, I think, basically, um, or 2006 even. It's like the, the first days of Django. This was done as a, I mean, frankly, at the time, nobody had much uh, experience building websites in that field. Um, so it's not a surprise um, that some parts of the code are, you know, eager to be replaced, to be honest. Uh, currently, <laughs> let's say it like that. It's, the, the actual, this module contains a thread local that is, depending on the request, um, actually contains the currently enabled language for this particular thread, which means, which translates to a user most of the time. Um, in other words, there's quite some state there, and this, this module also contains a loader to load all those PO files, the, this plain text format that I mentioned earlier. So it's, um, it reads a disk and puts it in the, into memory. So stuff that can be like a great bottleneck for your applications. It also contains other tools that you know, handle the various types of information such as converting between language and locale, which is a weird thing as well. I should probably mention what a locale is. It's just basically another term to define a set of all those um, information that builds a language. So grammar, number formatting, uh, even you know, uh, word length, character set, all this kind of stuff is called a locale. It's a technical term. So for now, we should just ignore that, just call it language and we are good. It's uh, because it's, it's an approximation that is f fine for us. So one thing that, I'm sorry for the bullet points here, but it's, uh, I need to clarify what we are doing here, is that um, when we request a site with Django, we're using a, an own middleware called locale middleware to detect the currently wanted language of the user. We do this with a couple of so data sources, such as the URL path, um, the session data from a previous visit when we set it, um, a cookie that could be um, set uh, like uh, separately where if the session app is not used for some reason. Um, and also, and this is kind of the, the big deal, uh, the accept language request header. That's something that is officially stated as something that should provide the information um, of Django delivering, uh, of what uh, Django should deliver in, in, a, in a translation. It's, um, it's a weird string that contains basically a recommendation what should be, um, uh, you know, what response kind of should uh, return. So, for example, you can say, um, I want to have German, but only like I'm okay if it's 70% done, that's all right. And, and if that's not all right, then uh, just fall back to English or to whatever other language. So this is a little bit of a weird standard, but it's official thing, so we have to support it. And the last bit, of course, is a fallback to the to a um, uh, static uh, setting called language code, which is by default the US English, which is the which is a good choice because that's where Django came from. <laughs> So my point is that we have tons of information here that where you cannot be sure what actually your user will see. And I think this is a particularly important in a, in a way how we decide what, how we can improve Django. This is, I think, really important. So another thing, I mentioned that before, get text. It's a, I wanted to, to clarify what that is if, in case you have actually uh, haven't looked into this. It's a, it's a tool set that comes out of the GNU world. So free and open source community. It's, uh, it's particularly available on all platforms. So it's really kind of the, the, the factor standard in where Django was created in, in that kind of environment where it, cr it was created in. It's not particularly the only one. So there, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Mozilla itself has various own standards to actually implement um, uh, translation and inter internationalization. Um, that doesn't mean that though that uh, GetText is bad or anything. It just means that um, we are on a specific, um, I don't know, in a, in a specific boat basically, and uh, don't we we don't take all the improvements in all the other systems, for example, into account. So this is a 
this is something where we are kind of bound to something that is yeah very particular, very opinionated. It fits to uh, fits to Django in that sense. It also generates, as I mentioned, this PO files, this plain text format, and is able to turn this into binary formats uh, called MO files, uh, which are I think a little bit more efficient to be loaded. Or I'm not sure to be honest what's happening. It's supposed to be uh, um, transparent, but yeah. So. Um, GetText usually as part of the Django workflow is um, as follows. When you add a new feature to your site, you will actually have to run a management command to make sure that you uh, extract all those strings that you've marked before in your templates, in your user-facing code, in your backend code, into those PO files. And then you hand over those PO files to the translators, wait for them to update the PO files so that you know, they contain the translations and run another management command to compile those PO files to MO files so they are get activated um, and the next server restart. So in other words, lots of steps, and I think this is particularly uh, annoying because it's a repetitive, very engineering-centric uh, way of making sure that your user-facing content um, is up-to-date. This, this is a problem. This is something, this is an engineer solution for a non-engineer problem. So we should really, um, no, well, this is a problem. Let's say it like that. Problems. Um, <laughs> JavaScript, we, in Django, we have um, quite a lot of features around this translation system. And part of that is also like a tiny bit of uh, support code that actually writes a bare bones get text implementation in JavaScript. It, uh, it allows you to ship not only the like a couple of JavaScript functions to access that uh, translation catalog, but also actually ships the literal translation catalog as the uh, JavaScript ar arrays with it. It's it's cre really quite amazing how how long this actually held up, especially now that JavaScript is developing so fast. It's um, in other words. It uses the backend infrastructure with, that we have in Django, you know, the, the, ma the, uh, the management commands and stuff like that, but it's not up-to-date technology on the front-end parts. So that's something that we definitely have to kind of reinvest. Time zones, I'm Eric. <laughs> it's a big deal because this is also touches lots of the ORM. We are uh, currently able to um, uh, interpret the date times that are stored in our database, for example, uh, depending on the currently active time zone. So similarly to how we store the current active language, we are storing the, the currently active time zone. We don't uh, very much uh, publish that, so we are, there's no easy way to, do, to, to, to change that except a Python API. Uh, but it, it is based on real, uh, really good uh, data. It's called uh, using a library called PyTZ that you probably have heard of. It's updated regularly, contains all the, yeah, yeah, all the, the different uh, time zone information that changes all the time when political changes happen, as they do. Um, this is a, it's a nice uh, feature, and it's a very important one, especially if you are targeting global audiences. Another thing that we have in Django, uh, local formats. As I mentioned, that's part of this localization topic. Um, it's been a, that was a result of Mark Garcia's uh, Google Sum of Code a couple of years ago, where we basically shipped those uh, format files without, with those module level Python um, variables to depending on, you know, for example, the uh, date time formatting, uh, depending on that, uh, not only allow uh, serialization, so uh, rendering value, date time values, but also deserialize it. So for example, if I, you know, Germans and forms, when I want to enter a, a date time, I enter it in the way that I'd like, you know, as a German. And so and I expect the form to actually um, uh, accept that. And that's what it does, basically, behind the scenes. The problem here is that we imported that data that's based on this uh, from a third-party data source uh, back in 2009, I think it was. So this is not up-to-date. And that data source is the Unicode CLDR common locale data repository. So it's, um, as you may know, Unicode is not only a coding system that we all know of it, so UTF-8, UTF-16 and stuff like that, it's all part of the Unicode um, coding system. But this consortium of companies also release uh, 
big bunch of, it's a table of XML files then that contains lots of locale data that, that you can use to interpret information depending on the culture you're living in. So I'm gonna read this quick. It's a formatting and parsing of dates, times, time zone, numbers, currencies, translation of names between all languages and language names, scripts, countries, and regions, currencies, eras, months, weekdays, day periods, time zones, cities, and time units. Also language information, grammar, and other writing relevant rules. This only scratches the surface. So it's really, it's a standardized way of describing what all the languages, all the sub languages and cultures actually consider uh, information. It's really quite amazing and it, you can programmatically access it. There are a couple of Python libraries to actually use it. So it is quite cool. Unfortunately, we're only using parts of it. The missing pieces. That's something that basically I hoped to be the big part of my talk. Unfortunately, I had to kind of, this was you know only the preparation phase, phase so far. The missing pieces are those that I want us to be working on to be able to to help those four billions that uh, come to our, uh, no, that become our customers and clients in the near future, that are the audience that we strive to be developing tools for. So let's let's use more of the CLDR, use more of those formatting options, um, because we're just ignoring a huge part of what cultural identity in the web is. Also, let's add an ability to update that data so that we don't have to install some kind of a random XML file, but also but simply have a management command to pull it from the internet because all this is done before. You're shipping all data. That's a problem. People will get actually pretty annoyed by that in case something is formatted wrong or if there's a decimal set wrong. No, it can happen. We are not good at translation catalogs. For example, the ability to merge catalogs. Imagine, for example, uh, merging translation catalogs between production and development, between uh, multiple volunteer translators, uh, between um, a, a main project and a sub-project, depending on the, the main project. You want to be able to use the translation. You, you don't want to um, you, you don't want to put too much work on your translators. So let's reuse the translations that have been done before. Also, a tool that allows us to visualize the strings that are marked in their template as well as in your, uh, in your backend code to see what is missing. What is actually something, you know, if you go to a site and you switch the language, you see it immediately because you don't understand language. But that may not be true if you're speaking English as your first language or if you're using a different language, your own language as a source trans uh, language. Or show a progress bar in the command line interface or the, even the admin. Let's, something, let's add something that helps the translators to see how much work is to be done to be complete, to, be, to deliver a good quality project uh, that uh, helps uh, those people in your audience to feel welcome as a, as their, with their cultural identity. Let's jump to the translation content part of this talk. Let's add specialized model fields and managers so that it can, it's easy for us to translate database content. There are dozens of apps, uh, I don't know, more than tens, I guess, um, that handle this specific use case. I think model translation was mentioned earlier today. It's something that has been done before. There are patterns that are very clear and very easy, and with the updates to the ORM, it's even easier to actually use those patterns. So for example, the one table translation pattern, where you put all the translation in one table, the multiple table translation, where you have one table per language, or the key value of translation, where you have a reference, basically, and use a, a URUID per string that you want to translate. All those uh, patterns are, have been used before a dozen and dozen of times. It's super silly that we ha ask our users to reinvent the wheel all the time. So, oh, let's even steal this code. You know, it's open source. It's, it's just look at. Let's look at those third-party apps and move things over to Django because it's that important. Composite field, you know, we need this and we know it, um, but it, I think it will actually help tremendously to making sure that the language specific code, uh, specific content in the uh, database is very, uh, you know, efficiently stored and can be retrieved without impacting the performance. Um, I assume this will be done at some point. So this is something that I hope to see eventually. Also, 
The forms widgets are you know, neglected for a couple of years. We haven't added much there. Uh, something that is would be very helpful, though, is that we could provide form widgets to, that would allow uh, our users to write easy editing interfaces to uh, to edit multilingual co content. So, in other words, change the language, be able to translate the content into that language. It would simplify implementation drastically. Other helpers. <clears throat> For example, um, there's a there are a couple of tools like that uh, out there. One of which is Transifex Live, and Mozilla has one called Pontoon that allows you to visually translate content. It's similar to what I mentioned earlier, where you see that some strings are not translated yet. But this goes even one step further, where we would basically allow uh, where we ship a, ja a small JavaScript library that would. Uh, be a, that would add a little bit of a UI in the front end in the user facing code where we click on it, allow the user themselves to translate or translators for that matter, and sync that data back to the PO files. It's not rocket science, you know, that's, but it's, this would go a long way to helping um, projects to be translated quickly. Also, language selectors. This is, I think, documented. I'm not sure why we haven't shipped this like as part of the admin, for example. Uh, there should be an easy way to, to switch the language of the site. It's, I mean, I've, I've personally written that dozens of times. It's just silly. And it's something that people expect, especially when it comes to, you know, if the, um, if there is, uh, if the language detection doesn't work, for example, that you want to switch to your own language. So, you, you know, you get the, you understand the things, you know. It's, uh, people expect to select there. Also, with the recent addition to um, uh, the, the recent addition of lots of top-level domains, uh, you've, you've seen I can you're kind of expanding that a lot, um, especially outside of the Western world. Uh, the host header should be part of the algorithm to detect which language to choose. In other words, imagine you have a big project. You want to make sure that the domain also can be signifying that you want to have a specific language. It's something easy to do. Uh, we haven't traditionally not take, you know, haven't taken the host into account because there are security issues involved. But I think we can like carefully do this. Maybe optional. Also, time zone selectors. Something as I mentioned earlier, we do have the backend code. We can we, we are able to switch the time zone uh, of daytime renderings um, easily in the backend. But we don't. Um, provide an out-of-the-box selector for our users. I don't know why. We, sh we should just actually ship the 10 lines of code so that people don't have to think about it. It's uh, easy, easy to be done. Maybe even, and that's a fun part, um, maybe even go one step further. Remember when I said the accept uh, language request header? Why not actually be leaders uh, and try to introduce accept time zone or content time zone request header, something where we actually can, as a framework, define something that would allow browsers, for example, to ship the time zone of the current user, and we detect that and show the daytimes automatically. That's something that normal users don't realize that. They, they don't grasp time zones. I mean, for show of hands, who understands time zones? <laughs> lies. You're all lies. Exactly. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> So imagine, imagine how weird that question is in a profile settings page to be asked what time zone is, and especially when you use technical time zones like UTC and the plus one zero zero or whatever. It's, um, we, or yeah, Day, daylight saving times, Jesus. <laughs> So um, we should be better with this. This is easy code to be written. We can support it very easily. And I don't think that we, um, we won't regret it, honestly. People, lots of people will be happy to see this. So my call for action. Let's, let's uh, improve the not invented here problem. Let's, re -re -rewrote, uh, let's rewrite the tra translation stuff based on Babel. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, just uh, just to clarify what Babel is, it's uh, it's that language uh, that library that I mentioned earlier that is capable of accessing the common uh, local um, repository, so that we actually can 
automatically by adopting that Babel library, we can support like a ton of more cultural identity uh, identity information. Uh, is that a real sentence? Anyways, uh, we can we can really you know, help by simply improving our own source code, our own quality of code. We could also push the boundaries in what actually open source projects such as Django is, you know, it's a right reaching project. We can push the boundaries of what internationalization actually means to the, to, to the web developers. And, you know, we can make it a first class citizen for our own project. We gotta do this because only then we can actually, you know, make a difference for those four billion people. So, yeah, that's it so far. Thanks. <laughs>
I think those are those need to be looked at again, agreed. Um, but this is, of course, a, a good chance for scope creep, um, where we basically, Django can't become an internationalization tool itself, but it needs to support enough that we are not getting in the way uh, for those uh, use cases. So yeah, um, let's revisit those decisions that we made in the past. Let's, uh, How plausible is it as someone who actually knows what the code in utils.translation looks like, to have, um, as amorix has been doing work with going, yes, we've got a templating language, but actually we could have template backends like we have database backends. How plausible is internationalization backends with a standard interface to Django so that you can use profiles, you can use something dumped in the database, you can use whatever it is that will suit you? Yeah, so you're referring to one ticket where, um, actually I agreed and accepted the ticket as well, to be honest. Uh, How many years ago? Many years ago, indeed. Uh, it was about adding this backend infrastructure, as we do with many of the pieces of Django, uh, that would allow us basically to switch com get text completely out of the um, out of the picture uh, and use key value stores, databases, whatever. Um, I think this is all. This is in an interesting uh, like theory, but it, to, to be honest, I see more problems on other pieces where other techniques would help more. In other words, I don't think GetText itself is the problem here. We're just using too little of GetText itself. We're using um, too little of the strategies that other projects have been actually uh, spearheading a lot more. So for example, the Linux community is great in that. They're like much farther along, so it's not a surprise that GetText comes out of this. Um, yeah, long story short, um, this may be just one part of the the way to fix it. Yeah, I'm going over here. Uh, uh, thanks for your talk. Internationalization is a thing close to us. Uh, I'm from Kuwait, so we we have two problems. One, it's Arabic, and second, it's left to right. Um, so that has its own challenges. But I wanted to ask, do you have any suggestions how we can make life easy for translators uh, themselves? Because so far, we're all talking about how to make life easy for programmers. Uh, but uh, like, I'll give you an example of the issue we face. Uh, we send the translation files out to external translators, and small white space problems make the whole file invalid, like smart quotes with, their, with the program that they use, because we tell them it's a text file, so of course they open it in like text edit or something. And so I wanted to ask, is there something on the horizon at Mozilla or that you know of that we can use? So uh, Mozilla has traditionally a messy software a roadmap. So uh, that's a part of our identity. So I can't, <laughs> I, I can't, uh, I can't say that we are having a solution, but we definitely have lots of experience with various tools. So, um, for example, uh, we're using a tool called Poodle, which is a um, South African software, as far as I understand, um, which is also nowadays Django based, uh, ironically. So uh, that allows it's a server side system. I think you could, in theory, set it up for your translators themselves and ask them to use it. I think that gets around all those issues that uh, you know, plain editing uh, introduce. And there are other uh, choices. For example, I, I talked a lot with, um, with a German translator, it's a good friend of mine, who does like book translations and stuff like that, big translations. And he has, um, he has a specific enterprise -y software for this. It costs lots of money, uh, so this may not fit for all those translator communities. But there are definitely tools outside that uh, out there that are specialized around the idea that you want to produce a good result PO file. It, it sounds weird, but that's the whole idea after all. It's a data management problem, um, kind of currently handled by non-engineers. And that's really, uh, you know, so I, I, I get what you're saying. And I think, you know, re do research about the, those tools. I don't have, um, like this tool that helps you, unfortunately, yet. Okay. Russell. Um, going back a little bit, you were talking about scope creep. Um, and yeah, obviously any of these problems, it's, it's a large complex problem that can just snowball out of control. Um, are there any chunks here that are easily digestible and could be just and could be put out as a project? I'm thinking in terms of being a, a summer of code studio, a student's project, or just something that is, easily identifiable as a 
self-contained depth that would be reasonably well constrained in, within within a particular scope. Because obviously you could just keep keep going, but there are there's low hanging fruit we should get at first. Uh, absolutely. So uh, I I agree. Uh, this is a big topic. So you know, forgive my hand waving a little bit, but is this to be honest, you know, Django's code, as even if it's a little bit uh, old and nasty, we can still f uh, fix it by simply getting rid of it. It's as uh, simple as that. Uh, and replacing it with stuff, you know, if take a look at the Babel uh, documentation, for example. It's a, a really beautiful Python API. And I think when you go through the feature list that we have currently and those features that we don't have, uh, alone, the addition, you know, moving the Django project to Babel would solve like tons of those problems. So, in other words, I mean, it's to me, it's uh, just another boring refactoring job, where we would depend instead of our own code that is messy and breaks all the time, base, uh, we would base it on other code that <laughs> breaks not as often. Now, uh, I think this is, I think the the, the general gist is that Babel is just better at that stuff where we have not been good in the past so um so and i think it may fall into the territory where if we discover a bug in it it's going to be nicer to try and fix it in babel upstream than it is to fix it in our own code so i didn't want to mention that because i wasn't sure uh, but armin is actually maintaining babel nowadays <laughs> so oh so so it's it's not as if babel is out of our uh, community basically we can still reach out to him and we can still I know uh, personally a couple of Django developers who, uh, who are maintaining a third-party um, app called Django Babel or something or Babel Django I don't know and that's kind of the current way of using Babel in the full uh, to its full extent uh, that may be uh, maybe the, uh, the the best start you know steal the code from there and work from from there how we can kind of yeah fix it or whatever, it's, uh, I'm not sure. Any more questions? So okay, what okay. version is this going to be in? <laughs> when are you going to write it? You, you know the answer, 2.0. Okay. Yeah. No, um, so this is, uh, to me, uh, this is just a call for action, as I mentioned. Um, I'm not particularly sure where to start. This is kind of where I hope to get some people to talk to tomorrow during the sprints. This is non-trivial, and this is definitely something that we can do at once, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but it's something that, you know, 10 years, 4 billion, it's, it's really a thing. Uh, so if you want to keep Django uh, alive and you know, want to keep it using, that means that let's, let's look at this kind of roadmap. Like, let's put it out there in the next five <coughs> years or so, so that we can actually use it till then. It's, um, it's a big one, though. Tim. I just wanted to put in a plug uh, because it hasn't been well advertised, but we have a process for translating the do documentation on TransFX. So if you Google uh, localizing Django documentation, you probably find it. Yeah, that's a very good point. Exactly. That's where I punted. Translating big pros, it's a whole different level where we basically... I'm I'm fearful about the fact that we we have this eager French community currently uh, translating everything in, into French. But you know, imagine we I don't we have more than sixty languages I think in, in Django. Imagine how much content we have we would have to manage. So this is something that I'd like to separate from this other work currently. Um, anyways, but it's a good uh, point. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ennis.